Light within my heart, light within my thoughts, light within my words. May one and all and everything, blessed and loved ever be. Welcome. I am Sister Who. I deal with a lot of abstract ideas on this show, uh, things that I'm told some people have difficulty thinking about, and yet, to me, the at the heart of knowing how to think is addressing these sorts of immaterial subjects and figuring out what our definitions are. And because from those understandings and from those definitions, which we may never consciously articulate, but we're living them out in our lives every day by the ways that we interact with others and the things to which we respond. The topic on my mind at the moment is distinctions between good and evil and you know determining if something is good or if something is evil and what is the meaning of subjectivity in the midst of all that and corresponding to that I guess is objectivity I've occasionally heard academics refer to the myth of objectivity and I think that goes too far the as much as I understand that every every perceiver, I guess you could say, has a context. And because of that context, every perception is unavoidably objective. The Even if you were to do a mechanical sensing of something, subjectivity enters in by how old this particular sensor is and whether it's worn out or if there was dirt on the lens, or any number of things. So you can't even always presume, you know, and all those other things could be objective variables that have to be added in, but by the time you get so many objective variables added in, you're once again right back to saying, well, how is this not almost synonymous with subjectivity? Uh, and somewhere in the midst of all that, I really like the word I got from Scott Peck within his book, In Search of Stones, in which he defines the term overdetermined when something has so many causes that it's impossible to say which is the primary one, that it's a combination of all these variables all coming together in exactly this way at exactly this time, that, you know, whose fault is it? What, is, what was the main cause? Well, there isn't one. There's you know, 45 main causes, and it, it's when the effect becomes overdetermined. And I find that most moments of life are overdetermined. On one hand, I think it's important to reach for objectivity because we want to be as clear about our truth and as clear about the ways our perception of truth is affected by our context as we can. On the other hand, we have to simultaneously be acknowledge that it is subjective because of all because of an awareness hopefully of what modifies our perception that there that I see things differently because I live in the early 21st century than I would if I were living in the early 17th century all the ideas my experience of life my capabilities uh, possible futures, everything, even the people I deal with every day would be completely different in another century, in another place, in, in another context be, because of the, the societal pressures and the uh, components that are present at that moment that would be weighing upon me and demanding a response from me. And could I really say, I'm not dealing with you and leave? Well, sometimes, sometimes not. It it could be, in some cases, it could be a life-threatening situation to, to take that kind of stand. And yet, history is filled with the people who did actually manage to do it. I, but one has to remember that as many times as Harriet Tubman made it back and forth between the North and South northern and southern parts of the United States, uh, escorting slaves to freedom uh, on the Underground Railroad, that for each time she did that, there were all these countless other cases 
in which slaves tried to make it to freedom and were killed or captured and taken back for you know granting that circumstances in history and society had come to a turning point at exactly that moment when Rosa Parks said no I'm not moving out of my seat uh, I'm sitting here on the bus where because I'm tired and I'm tired of putting it up with putting up with this harassment and so forth and Rosa Parks refusing to give up her seat became the beginning of the civil rights movement for black people in the southern United States. And, and ultimately, I suppose you could say for black people everywhere. Uh, I have difficulty believing that she was the first one to ever say, I don't want to give up my seat. I'm tired. I don't want to move. Um, my guess is that there were numerous other black people, both men and women, who in a similar situation said no and were arrested and carted off to jail and the world never noticed. It, what made her case different? It could be a number of different things. It could be that it was overdetermined, that there are too many variables and too many possible causes to say which one made her the turning point in, in the similar sort of way in, in the evolution of music. Why did the Beatles become the phenomenon that they were? Why did the music group ABBA become the phenomena that they were? Because why did John Denver become the phenomena that he was? And it has a lot to do with uh, a myriad of forces intersecting all at the same time. You know, that he came along right as we were in the early 70s. The environmental movement was surging. Uh, I'm told that when his song Rocky Mountain High was released, the immigration to Colorado is like a major balloon, a, a major bump on the on the scale, that there was such a surge of people moving to Colorado after hearing that song. Um, because of the fact simply that that music was having upon society as a whole, because it was such an inspirational song and so beautiful and, and inspiring and everything. The, and that's all a very subjective experience in a way. The, the immigration was certainly an objective uh, fact to note. And, but coming back to this point of recognizing subjectivity, objectivity, aspiring to objectivity, and yet recognizing subjectivity so that we know what questions to ask and where to look for possible effects so that we have a more complete understanding of whatever objectively happened, that the objective fact is that many people moved to Colorado. The subjective interpretation is that it has something to do with John Denver's song, Rocky Mountain High. It's ways that we create understanding and move through our world in trying to bring all of that to bear on is it good or evil, and if so, to what degree, and what do we do about it or not, I wrestled with this in my doctoral studies on my, I guess it would be the fourth, no, the fifth paper that I wrote. Um, I had a number of these these huge uh, doctoral papers to write that where I tried to wrestle with the questions and get at what really made the difference. The, the first paper was the development of symbiotic community, the second of symbiotic individuality, the third was the development of global mutual respect as a social system. The fourth was the essential contribution of spiritual vocation. And finally, the fifth paper was the definition of morality within cross-cultural and interreligious contexts. And after uh, consulting and wrestling with a number of very profound uh, thinkers in human history, the understanding that I finally came up with after all that reading and really wrestling with the questions was that in every single example I could find, what was defined as good was generally things that contributed to toward contributed to someone's survival, and what was defined as evil was something that somehow opposed or uh, interfered with the ability to survive. And so taking that as a starting point, I then began to notice how if someone were to say something was good or bad, there was, if they stopped and thought about it for a bit, there was always something behind the scenes 
that they were afraid of losing if whatever it was went forward. That it's, it's good if it moves me toward a promotion in my job. It's bad if it's something that interferes with my ability to get that promotion, having worked very hard for it. And, but that's kind of a narcissistic, self-oriented or self-centric, egocentric kind of way of defining things. In bringing that to relationships then, you know, which is where I said in, in cross-cultural and interreligious context, I wanted to see, you know, how do you define morality? And again and again and again, it was something was at stake if they thought it was evil, and it was something that empowered them if they thought it was good. And so in trying to understand somebody else's system, if they were to respond badly, my suggestion was that we look at what it, what is it that they fear losing? What part of themselves do they consider essential that would be somehow limited or compromised by this action? And is there a way to do this action that doesn't cost them what they think they will lose? In which case we will have moved to a point of collaboration instead of competing for, I mean, ultimately good and evil are competitive terms. And when we talk about who wins and who loses, we're talking about who has to put up with evil and who gets to celebrate good. Because for the, the one who loses, there is there's some kind of loss, there's something that takes from them that leaves them going home more impoverished than when they arrived. And that's, I suppose, where I've never been terribly fond of any sort of competitive activity because I don't want anyone going home in pain. I don't want anyone going home suffering. I don't want anyone going home feeling like they have to come to terms with having lost. And and so I prefer non-competitive activities. And to some minimal and, and I guess I would say almost pathetic degree, but which to me it always seemed a little pathetic, at the end of a game, uh, of a sports game, very often the the rule of thumb that I saw demonstrated was that the two teams would pass by each other shaking hands or something, the notion being that they would walk off, that they would leave the, the game as a game, that yes, there was a winner, yes, there was a loser, but we're all friends at the end. Well, it's a nice thought, um, but still, you know, we could say, well, better luck next time, but that still seems very lame. And I guess that's where, if in that situation, I would point instead to things like, what did you enjoy during this? Was there a moment that even with losing the game, was there still a moment where maybe you hit a home run or something that would give you a piece to hold on to and something to remember and something to recognize and something to celebrate something to try to bring with you into the next, uh, assuming there is a next, uh, similar sort of event. It's not that we need to run from our subjectivity. It's, it's that we need to recognize how our subjectivity predisposes us to interpretations of good and evil and that ultimately what love recommends is that we all be winners and that everything be good. And is that possible? Well, you can't play a game without there being winners and losers. Maybe we can have an activity without it being a game. Maybe we can have everyone competing against themselves. That this is a competition between you and your previous record instead of saying this is a competition between you and me and I mean in various movies they say the line like it's supposed to, it's a challenge and everyone's supposed to laugh and cheer and what have you but when one boxer in a boxing ring looks at the other and says you're going down and I'm like if we love each other what is gained by that uh, if it's about developing skill, that's one thing. If it's about uh, 
accomplishment, that's something. But nobody ever actually comes up by putting somebody else down. I, I was talking with someone uh, recently who wanted to support women writers, and I said, well, fine, then support women who are writers. And I understand that the patriarchal systems of society have frequently left women with the short end of the stick, and that there is some balancing that needs to happen. There's some celebration of good literature written by women that needs to be done. What I briefly argued with just one statement or so with the person about was that they were going beyond that to say that um, for the next whatever period of time, I'm certainly not uh, reading any books by any male author. And I said, well, what if they're good books? Well, not for now, you know, and, and but the way she began phrasing her statements, it was like she was putting men down in order to bring women up. And there's nothing about putting men down that brings women up. It's about bringing women up, period. It's putting someone else down doesn't do it. It's, it's like when people would tell me, you can always take encouragement from the fact that there's someone worse off. And I would respond to them, why do you want me to base my joy on someone else's suffering? That doesn't make any sense. If you're uh, an empathetic, loving person, and you don't want anyone to suffer, saying, well, it's not so bad for me because he's worse off, or she's worse off, or at least I have more than so-and-so. Well, I don't know why anybody should be drawing any joy from that. To me, that is evil, because it takes away from the interconnectedness of the human family. It when I was in my freshman year of um, college and was introduced to Socrates, uh, introduced because I, I don't know that it was ever really addressed, um, that that historical figure was ever really addressed in high school or, or before for me, but I got to college and I had this freshman, the first year of college got to, got this class on Socrates and was introduced to Socratic dialogue and so forth. And uh, one of the more famous speeches that was recorded is where uh, Socrates is discussing with someone uh, what makes piety what it is. Um, and so I took that same dynamic and I, for a number of weeks, as I was trying to come to terms with my own spirituality and with the sometimes ridiculous religious notions I was hearing around me at that particular college, um, I decided to wrestle with the question of what makes sin sinful. And of course the theologian will say, well it's because uh, God forbids it. It's be simply because the Bible says don't do that. And I said, well, considering how many different people have translated the Bible and how differently words have been interpreted and translated over and over and over again, and there was one day that some other friends and I, who all knew foreign languages, decided to play uh, this game called Telephone, um, kind of going back to the early days of telephone communication, where somebody would repeat something and repeat something and repeat something, and it would be passed along a phone line. And by the time it got to the end, the story wasn't anything like it was at the beginning. Well, we decided to do it with different languages. So we, somebody came up with a phrase and we went from English to German to English to Spanish to English to French to English. And of course, by the time we went back and forth of that many languages, the phrase wasn't anything like what it started out. And, and it was a total confusion. With all of that, looking at the Bible and realizing this is a document that has been handed down over literally thousands of years, how can we actually know how anybody understood anything at the time that the first text was written? Especially because we don't have access to the first text anyway, so we don't know what words were used, but we don't even know how the language of that text was understood at its at the time it was written. And is that what, it, you know, and then everyone that I've talked to would say, well, God took care of the difference and made sure it was okay. Well, if that was the case, then why don't all Christian theologians d agree? 
And obviously, there somebody asked me recently about the Christian perspective, and I said, which one? Because there are so many different things parade, that parade themselves in the name of Christianity. But I was wrestling with the question of what makes sin sinful. And one person said that, according to some linguistic derivation, sin is a word that has been translated as the distance on an archery target from the bullseye in the center to wherever the arrow lands. So it's basically how far off the mark you are. And I thought, well, I guess that's something, but I still need to figure out how to inter how to decide what is sinful and what is not. And so at the time, all I could really come up with is that there was always something about sin that was destructive to relationships, to health, to the holistic uh, sense of a person, to something, somehow destructive. The problem with that, of course, is that some things are destructive from one perspective, but not from another, uh, partly because each person uh, may or may not have a concern about the part that was diminished or wounded or destroyed by whatever particular action. If someone, uh, if someone values the life of every farm animal, they may become a vegetarian and not eat meat ever again. If someone does not value the life of every farm animal, they will think nothing of uh, slaughtering chickens and hogs and cows and, and whatever they need to to have uh, food to eat. I don't, you know, that's, that's a controversial, that particular uh, distinction is controversial because there are people on both sides who want to make their own choices. I don't think humanity has evolved to a point yet to just say which it is for all or which is right for both. We need to come up with different ways of being human, I guess is what it comes down to. But in wrestling with this definition of good and evil and how do we create a moral standard? If someone thinks they're going to lose something, if they're going to lose their sense of self, they're going to lose their memory, their history, their opportunities, their something they value, then they will, uh, are in, in, according to my hypothesis, I guess is the best way to put it, they would define that as evil. If a person is going to benefit from something, they would define it as good. On one hand, I want to respect others' subjectivity, but I also want my own to be respected. And so then it becomes, it becomes a question of boundaries, of where good and evil start and stop. That where good for you stops is where it becomes evil for me. And where, evil, uh, and where good for me stops is where it becomes evil for you. And so it becomes important to consider with every action or situation, who else is affected, how are they affected, what's the outcome of this? And to do anything without giving any thought to who is affected by this becomes a kind of a narcissistic or selfish um, smallness, I guess you could say, because it allows evil to happen and naively assumes that that evil won't come back on oneself at a later time. Uh, what some people call the law of karma, that if you if you were to steal something from someone in order to benefit yourself and then two weeks later you need that person's help for something and of course they won't give it because you stole from them. Well, you kind of set up your own situation, but I, you know, and as much as I don't want to get into victim blaming, it's, I don't know if it's so much me blaming the victim as the wrestling with the possibility that we judge our that our we judge ourselves by our own actions that my action becomes my punishment at a later time and it's not that anyone else has to judge me it's that i put something in motion a row of dominoes if you will or some kind of effect that um that in a sense, you could say, I'm attacking my own future. 
I guess it, if that makes sense. There are a number of examples of that, though, and I've seen them uh, demonstrated a lot in uh, popular movies as well, where someone will do something and realize too late that what they did is now sabotaging them, and it becomes a question to see if they can save themselves from their own mistake, from their own consequence. And that's where, if we're there for each other with unconditional love, that's where forgiveness can really come into play. And and the whole exercise is not a complete waste if, in fact, we did learn something from it. But but when we're going through it, it's, it's not the time to be doing the learning because it's it's too close, it's too intense, it hurts too much. After we get past it and have managed to deal with the circumstances in whatever way, then it's important to go back and do the reflection and figure out in what way or to what degree have both good and evil been apparent within ourselves. And how do we come to terms with that? I, I hope the ideas that I've shared in the last half hour have been helpful to you. It's a complex topic and I'm quite sure that I only scratch the surface. So if anyone has anything more they'd like to add to this conversation, I think every conversation is an ongoing conversation and I welcome you to be a guest within a future episode. Thank you.